Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mandy Aguilar, and I'm a librarian at Irving Public Library, where we are doing the NEA Big Read. Um, all, all, all of our community is reading a book called A Small Story About the Sky by poet Alberto Rios. It's a collection of poetry. Um, and tonight we are talking to two young adult authors who have written books that are set in the Southwest desert, um, just like many of the poems in this collection of poetry. Um, the NEA Big Read goes on for the rest of the month of February. Um, and uh, it is supported by a grant. Um, it's a, the NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. And we really thank them for our support, allowing us to put this great programming on for you. Um, so now I would like to welcome Samantha and Raquel. And um, if you would just please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the book that you're going to talk about tonight. Raquel, would you like to go first? <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, okay. My name is Raquel vasquez Gilliland. I am the author of Sia Martinez and the Moonlight Beginning of Everything. And um, it's a story about a girl whose mother was deported. And one day she is in the desert and an extra extraterrestrial spacecraft crashes in front of her. And she goes to investigate inside is her mother. And she has to figure out what is going on? So that's the, the basic premise of my book. It's set in Arizona. Um, and I think that's it, that's good. Thank you, and Samantha. Okay, so my name is Samantha Mabry and it, your audio is not the problem. It's my voice that has totally <laughs> gone up. Um, but I'm doing my best. And the book that I'm talking about uh, sort of links in with it is my second novel called All the Wind in the World. Um, and it's set in the far west Texas town of Valentine, sort of a near future environmental disaster setting. And the two main characters, a boy and a girl, work as um, cutters. They cut my gay, which is the cactus that is, um, then the heart of it is mashed down and made into um, mezcal tequila. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of a love story, sort of a tragic love story um, where they're, the, the couple is pulled apart and you kind of don't know if they're going to get back together or not, or if they should get back together or not. Excellent. Um, I've read both books and both are completely wonderful. So um, I'm excited to talk to you both tonight. And thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I have some questions that I've prepared and, and sprinkled in, I have a couple of audience questions as well. Um, and if we get any more audience questions in the chat um, on any of our social media, um, I'll try to pepper those in too. Um, so my first question is that both of these books are set in the desert, but if my research is correct, neither of you actually live in the desert. So um, I wanted to know if you had lived there before or did you travel there to do research? How did that desert setting come about? <clears throat> I can take this one first. So I live in Dallas and Valentine is about a eight and a half hour drive west from Dallas, still in Texas. Um, and I would, for like about four or five years, I would spend my summers in far west Texas. And I would spend a month, we'd rent the same house, my husband and I, and we'd sometimes take hikes into Big Bend National Park. But I always really loved this, this place. Um, I think that there is, and we'll probably talk a lot about this, but I think that there's magic there without sounding corny. It's, it's really hard to describe. There's something really, like in, in Marfa, Texas, where I say there's the Marva, Marfa mystery lights where you can look out on the horizon and there's some like magical lights and no one knows what they come from. Um, the sky is very huge and it always smells great out there. Um, and so I just always wanted to, I always wanted to write a Western. I'm a big fan of like the literature of the West, um, but I wanted to adapt it into, you know, the kind of story that I wanted to write. and. And so the story really sprung out of the setting. You know, I, I knew that I wanted to write a story there and it couldn't have been said anywhere else. 
Thank you. How about you, Raquel? Uh, I grew up basically in the tropics. So uh, I drove through Arizona um, just once, maybe twice. And I swear I've only spent like an hour there in the Southwest, really. Um, but it is so different from where I grew up that it just uh, really stood out as Samantha was saying is someplace just full of this magic that I was unfamiliar with. And um, so I haven't lived there and I haven't really spent a ton of time there, but it just left a mark on me, particularly uh, the cigars, the cacti uh, that we would, we drove by. Um, that uh, scene is very vivid. And um, I also connected the desert with, through a book called The Woodwife by Terry Weinling. Um, so she's a lover of the desert as well. And um, I think that book kind of uh, introduced me to the desert. And then later when I visited, I had kind of a, a, my own personal connection. Okay, great. Um, you both anticipated my next question just a little bit, but that's great. That means that we'll have even more fun answering it. Um, so in his book, um, A Small Story About the Sky, the one that we are reading here in Irving as a community, Alberto Rios talks a lot about desert flora. He has poems just for desert flora. And both of you feature desert flora, um, desert plants heavily in your books. Um, and you both just mentioned them, the maguey and the saguaro cactus. Um, what is it that's so compelling about these plants? What's so cool about them? Um, just from your own perspective, why did you want to include them so so much in your books? I can go um, first. Yeah, go for it. You, okay. <laughs> um, there is something uh, deeply human about saguaro cacti. Um, perhaps it is there's their shape or that they're ancient. They grow so slowly. I mean, if you see one of size, it's at least, it's definitely a hundred years old, maybe 200, maybe more. And so you have these plants that are ancient and just have this intense presence and just this, their whole lives just feel like this really massive myth to me. Um, and there's a lot of folklore and myths connected to, to it. So that's one of the reasons why when I first started writing Cia Martinez, one of the first creation myths I wrote was inspired by uh, this plant, which is the place where she goes to drive between the cacti that looked like Adam and Eve or the cacti that looked like a man and a woman who created the whole universe. So that's where I found the magic from in the saguaro cacti. Sam? Uh, so I hope that people like Googling these, these cacti, right? They're very different looking, you know, saguaro is the one with the, with the arms and the maguey is the one with like, the spikes. And um, so this book, All the Wind of the World has been out for about three years, two and a half years. And I remember someone was asking, like, is this plant like a metaphor for the main character? I was like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, it had not occurred to me until they said that, but I, I really liked that. Like, there's this, the, the process of harvesting the mage, which is sort of described at the beginning of the book. <clears throat> it takes so much work. You have to, like, hack off these big spines. And then you have this giant heart. Um, and then the hearts get loaded into a truck and then sent away. And then you have to roast them. And then if you see very old school ways of mashing the roast in my guy with like, like seriously, it's like a guy driving a donkey cart in a circle and like the wheels are going over the mage. And then at the end of this process, you get this liquor, right? That's like really precious little liquor. Um, and I love that. I love this something that is, it goes from one very extreme form to this very pure thing. Um, so while that was not, I guess, maybe that was originally my intention, but our reader kind of brought that into focus. 
How cool. Uh, thank you guys both for that answer. Um, I have a, an audience question. This is from Farah and it's for Raquel. Um, Raquel, you're also a poet, just, um, just like Alberto Rios that we're talking about. Um, and you've published quite a bit of poetry. Um, and Farah wants to know, how was writing a novel different from writing poetry? And did you find it easier or harder? Well, uh, for Sia Martinez in particular, um, I had just finished my MFA in poetry. I just finished writing for my first two books of poetry. And I had just finished reading and, and writing, like I said, poetry for like four years straight. Um, I hadn't really read much fiction besides fan fiction, which is awesome. <laughs> I love it. But so when I first started writing Sia, um, I wrote it in my style of prose poetry. And I, I think it's pretty evident in the short chapters that re to me and people have told me they read like poems. It's, it's similar to my style of prose poetry, particularly the creation myths I like to write. Mm -hmm. um, so that's. I think the question began with, uh, which one was harder? Is that where? where yeah, is it easier or harder? Question? Yeah. Oh, I would say plotting is difficult for me, so it's harder. I mean, I do revise poems, but I feel like there's more, more intuition for me. Maybe because I did such intensive study, it's more instinctive. Whereas with with <laughs> books, I need help from other people. <laughs> Uh, critical partners and my agent and editor, they help me get it on track. That's great. Um, so both of you have talked a little bit about the magic of the desert, the magic that you feel um, when you're out there or when you're looking at it. Um, and you've, you've also used a lot of folklore um, and traditions in your work. Um, and I wanted to ask um, if any of those were based in reality, are they are, are any of them based on things that you grew up with in your families or grew up hearing in your communities, or were these folklore, or these uh, magical traditions, things that were completely made up for the book? You can go ahead, Samantha. I'm trying to think. If you um, have an answer, go for it. Okay, um, it's a mixture. I love to write creation myths. So some of them is some of them are made up. Uh, some are not. Like I grew up hearing my grandmother, just like Sia, is saying we may or may not have come from corn or mice. Uh, and we also grew up believing that if you face a traumatic incident, your soul becomes scared and splits off and runs away, and you have to find it and call your soul back home. So that is also my book. I didn't make that up. That's what we grew up uh, believing. But there are other uh, the other uh, parts of the book that are kind of world building that I created to suit the story, the characters, and the themes. Excellent. The reason why I I had to think about it was because I can't, I don't I don't think so. Like for this book. I think that, that, you know, I'm trying to, like, I'm like trying to think about this book, but I don't, I don't think so. There are things that I think could seem magical, but are real. Um, like the storm, like a swarm of bees, um, both of which happen in far west Texas. Um, so I try to not make there's people who tell stories but that's not the same I, I did I did you know like I just said insert some things that may seem magical but are sort of part of the strangeness of the desert okay um Raquel you also bring in science fiction into the desert um and I'm wondering um what what was it that that made you kind of put those two that setting and that genre together? Um, is there anything in particular that sparked the, the aliens? Well, the, there's a big 
uh, alien lore has it has roots. I want to say in the Southwest. Um, and I used to be really into like alien extraterrestrial conspiracy theory when I was like a teenager. So just when, and also I love the X Files. And they often found themselves in the Southwest modern fully mm-hmm. because of that uh, the mythic roots of aliens. So I just it just felt natural to me that I wanted to write a story with aliens and. Um, to kind of go to that uh, that land where um, it all seemed to start, I guess, in the American like sort of mythic landscape. So, um, what is the weirdest thing that you googled while doing your research or while writing the book? Either of you, or both. Mine was about the bees. About the like. Africanized killer bees and how big their swarms could get and what would happen if they descended on a group of people. That's terrifying things to read about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what probably, about you, Raquel? Yeah, probably the weirdest things I Googled were just the more um or the lesser known conspiracy theories. I, I kind of dove back into my old stomping grounds. Um, There's some really more widely known conspiracy theories involving extraterrestrials. Um, Like there's a colony inside the moon, you know, like that's sort of, if you're into lore, you've heard that before, but there's some really, really creepy uh, theories that kind of branch off and I, I, they really freak me out, just the idea of them. I won't discuss them. <laughs> they just, uh, um, it's actually, when I was a teenager, it was actually those really un- unusual um, theories that, or yeah, conspiracy theories that really just kind of pushed me away from that because they were just, they can get very dark is the thing. Uh, so, so probably the, those were some of the weird things I encountered while researching. Okay. Um, I'd like to go back to um, a small story about the sky, um, the book that we're all reading together. Um, And I know both of you had a chance to take a look at it. Um, I was wondering if there were any poems in there that really spoke to you um, and or did you find any connections between his poetry and the work that you've done on your novels? Um, I can go first. On page 20, there's a poem, a short poem called The Thirst of Things. And it's a poem about the desert remembering and missing what it once was, which was the ocean. And it talks about the flora in the desert um, and how the plants were once coral and puffer fish and green seaweed in their ocean lives. And at the end of the poem, the speaker turns the desert having remembered its ocean life to us people or the reader remembering, or at least for me, remembering our previous ocean lives perhaps and our evolutionary you know, uh, lineage. So that spoke to me. My, uh, I love creation myths. I love thinking about the beginnings of things and the origins of things and things having lives prior to this one that were uh, vastly different. And yet when he looks, when the speaker looks at the desert, they see what it once was still, um, despite the differences, despite how much it has changed. So that was just right up my alley. I bookmarked it right away. (laughs) That's the one, that's the one that spoke to me the most, I think. That was one of my favorite ones as well. Um, just it, it, even here in North Texas, we were also part of the Great Inland Sea years and years ago. Um, so you can see those fossils of the um, marine life and the marine yeah. flora. It's just so hard to imagine that that is uh, what we're walking on. And um, yeah, 
the way that he the way that he um, uses the his words in that poem um, it just it's so evocative of the the setting of um, today and of millions of years ago I just really love it I'm glad that you connected with it too um, Samantha was there one or two that spoke to you uh, so um, I'm looking at page 76 in a poem called Dry Water. Um, and I'm not going to read it because I can't talk, but it says, you know, we have rain, but it's a dry rain, a skinny rain, a thin mm -hmm. water coming down in a covert action. And then the last couplet is, and to taste it, to taste it at all, you must dream it into the glass you think you hold. Um, you know, I know that for the years that I've been going out to the desert, there's burn bands. You know, it, there's just, um, you know, several miles away, there's there's the Rio Grande. But, you know, in that part of West Texas, there is, um, it's been really dry a lot of the time. And I, when writing this book, was always trying to think about ways to write the dryness, right? You like try to think of different ways to write your setting instead of being like, it's hot, it's dry, you know? <laughs> and so I thought that this was like, oh, I had never thought of like writing water this way, you know, or writing how dry it is this way out of thinking so hard about how to do that, you know, when writing. And, and so this is really beautiful to see. Thank you. Um, that's great. Um, Samantha, I remember um, it, it admittedly has been a few years since I read All the Wind in the World, but I just, I remember the feeling of dust when I, when I read it. Um, and as someone who kind of struggles with, <laughs> struggles with asthma, it was like uncomfortable to read about the, the sort of dryness and the dust in the atmosphere. Um, I think you did a really good job um, creating that part of the setting. Okay. Yes. Um, and we do have another audience question um, and it is about setting. Um, it is from Kristen in Dallas. She asks, where do you draw inspiration for world building or setting? She also mentioned that when she writes, she really struggles with the desert as a setting. Um, so maybe you can address that in your answer as well? Was it a struggle at all? So world building and the desert. Um, I can speak to this. It's, it's kind of specific though. Like, <clears throat> so I don't like to make up things. It's kind of like sounds ridiculous, but like all my books, even if they have sort of magical elements in them are in real places. And so what that does is it gives me a frame that I can't get out of. And that to me is really helpful um, because I'm not the kind of writer who can really actually form an extremely complicated world. I mean, maybe, but I haven't tried. But it's helpful for me to have like a box. And so I know that Valentine is a real place. I know what it looks like. I know what it smells like. I, I really know this place from having been there lots of times. Um, and I know that people live there and people have lived and died there and the families have lived and died there for centuries. And so I do not get to be creative with people's homeland, like too much. And so that's how I think about it. I try to honor um, I think I sort of Raquel does this in her book too. You sort of like to honor the history of the place, the clashes of the cultures that have been there, the people who have lived and died there. Um, and you like to bring those into the present. But um, that's how I write about a place that is real. It's by remembering that it's real. And that if somebody who lives in Valentine read the book, they would say, this is my town, like you got it right, right? Instead of like, I don't know, this, what you're describing here is just ridiculous. You know, this will never happen. So I try to, again, honor the place and the people that are there. 
Thank you. What about you, Raquel? Um, setting is uh, one of those uh, elements that come really easily to me. Uh, I think maybe it's, I have a background in visual art and a background in poetry. And so, um, Samantha was just talking about smell. So I would say to uh, the writer with the question, I'm sorry, I don't remember their name, but to consider all of the senses, um, that's one way to ground a setting into a story and to consider unusual metaphors. The first one that you write is usually not the most juicy or interesting one. So, so for instance, when I was writing Sia Martinez, um, at one point she describes the uh, flowers on the cigarro um, as bone white. Now I went through a lot of different whites. Uh, I probably wrote cloud white, snow white, but I went, but I settled for bone white. Um, to me, that's a little more unusual and it speaks to uh, an element that's reoccurring in the book, which is bones um, and debt. So that's my little writing setting spiel, I guess. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, I also, I just love that the image of you sitting thinking through all the different types of white and then finding the one that was perfect. That's, um, that's really part of writing. It's not just, you know, banging out sentences and dialogue and the story. There's, there's a lot of, of real thought and fine tuning. Um, I think you both described that really well. That is my favorite part is like, tuning a sentence until it sings. Usually it requires deleting or changing a metaphor to an adjective, right? Like she's saying like white, like a bone and you say bone white and you're like, it's way better. Why would I have all those extra words? I love setting. I just write setting. Just the whole book is a tree. Mm -hmm. Right, what boy is a tree. But you have to have plot, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think you both got plot. Pretty, pretty well in these books. So um, I wanted to, to pivot just a little bit and talk about um, kind of a little bit about what's going on in the world. Um, your, both of your stories deal with characters, teenagers who are up against a lot, sort of um, tough choices, almost insurmountable choices, really stressful situations. And right now, um, teen readers are going through something similar in kind of in a different way, but just so much added stress and anxiety as we're going through this pandemic, um, dealing with all sorts of um, different stressors that they're not used to, uh, although maybe they're used to them by now. Um, and I wondered what hope do you think these readers could take away from your book um, since you, you both show teens kind of getting through the terrible things. Hard question, Mandy. I'm sorry. Because as, as we know, as we were talking about before this went live, we're like talking about our little struggles, not little, like our big and little struggles, you know, sort of getting us through the day, you know. So it's, it's hard for me. It's like, Dr. Heal thyself. It's hard for me to give advice to a person, you know. Um, but I don't know, Raquel, do you have an answer for that? The question is, what do I hope the uh, readers, young readers take away from my book that might be helpful? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, um, it might be helpful in this time. My, I think perhaps, um, I hope that when people read Sia Martinez, um, they feel a sense of wonder in this world. And I feel like wonder is the source of creativity. I want young people to make art. So I hope that somehow they are inspired, whether it's by my book or just ideas in it or in the acknowledgements when I talk about uh, my process. Um, I want them to, to make art 
that's my, I guess that's my, what I want my takeaway to be. I mean, here's my answer. I am going to regret saying this, but so my main character, her name is Sarah Jacqueline, Sarah Jacqueline. And she is, she has a lot of like anger. And um, I was thinking about, you know, I, I, when I was growing up, I, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. I was like a very angsty person, just like, just mad, just mad and angry. And I liked loud rock music, you know, and I like, I just, and, and what literature did for me was did not tell me how to get better. It validated my anger and said that this is an emotion that is valid and you can have it. And so I think that maybe, I mean, I know that I go through this even now, but like it, it's a young person and you're like, you are going through depression. You are, going, you are angry. You are sad. It, you, it is not about being less angry. It is not about being less sad. Like, this is fine. You can feel this right now because this is awful, you know? And maybe you can find yourself reflected in, in, a, in a book and it doesn't make you feel so alone, right? So for me, I found it reflected in music anger music um that I still hear on the radio sometimes and I'm like yeah, well, yeah. um but I also think I yeah I I I, I was I was not fond of narratives and why novels where the like lonely broken person becomes whole through finding a friend or a boyfriend I was like get freaking real so I was like maybe angry young woman find other angry <laughs> I mean just like I kind of I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again but again it is okay it is okay to be sad and mad and and again maybe you can find find some validation in an art so that you don't like act out on it in kind of negative way I think that's great. Um, self-validation is incredibly important and um, can then leads to self-actualization. Um, I, I loved both of your answers. Raquel, you have been um, a debut author during a pandemic. Um, and so I'm sure that that changed what you thought your debut season, your debut year would be like. Um, can you talk just a little bit about what it's, how it's been for you um, with a, a brand new first time book on the shelves and, you know, not able to get out there to bookstores to promote, um, to book festivals? Um, how are you coping with that? Well, um, the pandemic overall has obviously been horrible. But as someone with severe anxiety, um, I have found virtual meetings to be uh, less anxiety inducing than traveling. Um, so there is a little bit of a benefit there. Um, although I am disappointed that I did not get to have a launch party with people and food and like a reading and or signing books that's something I think I really kind of miss was in my uh vision of becoming an author is signing books and I haven't really gotten to do that uh, I have signed books to send to places and I have you know visited one bookstore uh one independent bookstore um where we did the social distancing and I signed their stock but uh yeah I just in some ways it feels like is my book out there is it really out there you know and then um and then someone will write me and, uh, telling me that they really liked it and I'm like okay yeah it's it's still out in the world <laughs> so yeah oh thank you for that um my, my books were all returned because my last book, This Isn't All the One in the World, my most recent book came out at the end of March. 
and all the bookstores placed orders for it and then closed and so they returned them all. Oh no. I That's know. horrible. I know. Gosh. If you're watching out there, go buy these books. <laughs> And I know we have given away some um, of, of each of them at our library locations. Um, and I'm not sure if we have given them all away or if there's still some out there, but um, Irving folks, get in touch with um, our three locations and see if we've still got some. Um, you can come pick them up if we still have any. Uh, we just started giving them out this week. So um, those will also be out there in the world. <laughs> Uh, um, I wanted to ask, um, kind of going back to the desert, if you have, what's your, what's your favorite thing about the desert? Or do you have a favorite memory about the desert? Um, just something really lovely to pivot back into good stuff. So every afternoon from four to six, uh, I would lay in the hammock in the backyard and read. And that was my, I like, this seems like from a different lifetime right now. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm also a mother of a small child. <laughs> so, like, to have a two hour block to yeah. like lay somewhere and read. I remember I read The French Lieutenant Woman the last summer I was there. It's a great book. But, um, and like it, you know, you can see the sky, you know, and see the, I, I like to watch wind blowing trees, simple stuff. Okay. What about you, Raquel? Um, well, like I said, I haven't spent loads of time in the desert, but, uh, I do remember being amazed when I st we stopped by a gas station that didn't have any uh, paper towels. But by the time I reached my, the car, my dripping hands were dry. Just the way the, the air is so greedy for water. <laughs> like I said, I grew up in South Florida. I just, I did not imagine that that was possible until it, until it happened to me. Um, so that's an, <laughs> that's something that sticks out. Um, I, I would also like to answer my own question, um, which is probably a no-no, but uh, I went to Joshua Tree National Park uh, a few years ago, and um, that's a, another type of desert flora that is just otherworldly looking. Those, those trees are, are so beautiful and um, for an old person like me who grew up listening to you two, who have an, an album called The Joshua Tree, it was kind of a, almost like a spiritual journey for me to go <laughs> and see these um, really amazing trees in just like the most beautiful landscape. But yes, that parched feeling in the air just takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what a, what a cool, what a cool place the desert is. It's um, also like the sense when you drive somewhere you know, you're in your car and you're driving out some desert and then you get out and like the quietest you have ever heard like your ears do something different because they're not used to not hearing anything and so you I mean this is like in Valentine or outside of Valentine and I got out of the car and it's like wah, 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 wah. you can hear I mean, your like, own circulation yeah wow um Sam, you mentioned the Marfa lights. Um, did you uh, did you ever get a chance to see them as as kind of like a mystical part of the desert? I have a good story about this though. Okay, <laughs> so this was many years ago. It was my first trip to Marfa, and um, I went with a friend. So there's like a viewing area, okay, and you can like you're like, is that in? Like sometimes they show up in like different ways, like there's really bright or really dim and and she was like um I, I think those are headlights like I, I don't think those are those are I think it's headlights from this world let's go let's go find them right. so we get in the rental car 
and we drive south it's in the direction of Mexico. We're not close to Mexico. It was like 45 minutes away. And then we're driving, we're driving, we're driving. We're driving for a long time. And um, we find no more flights. So we finally decide to turn around and go back. But to turn around and go back, you have to go through a border patrol checkpoint. And um, so we pull up and <laughs> the guy was like, what are you doing here? And my friend goes, we're looking for the Marfa lights. And then they were like, pull over, like pull over to the station. So we had to get out of the car. They searched the car with dogs. My friend is like crying. They think we're smuggling drugs from Mexico because my friend had to mention the thing about the Marfa lights. And she's like, she was in tears, but I was just like waiting. I was like retelling this whole story so I could tell the story for years and years and years. It was fine because I guess there, there were no drugs in the car. I mean, there were no drugs in the car. <laughs> and so uh, that was my Martha White story. Wow. Well, maybe next time you go, or it, perhaps you'll see lights and there'll be a, an alien ship landing in the, in the desert. You'll be transported to Sia Martinez land. <laughs> right. Um, I'd like to do a few shorter questions, um, lightning round type stuff. Um, and I wondered, um, what's your favorite writing time? Do you like to write in the morning, in the afternoon? Are you a night owl? Is, or do you have a preference? You wanna go? Thank you, Dora. Um, well, I'm also the mother of a small child, so pretty much anytime he likes me at this time in my life. But I used to love writing at night and I miss it. I can see a lot of your book is set at night. There's a lot of the cool action happens at night. So you can see maybe some parallels there. What about you, Samantha? Well, since I'm also kind of any, anytime cause I work and I have a small child. But when we went into quarantine and I was home with my child, I had to get up at 4.30 to do work or else I would not work. And then I kind of liked the, the five o'clock to seven o'clock time. And I still get up that early sometimes because it feels really productive. Wow. Wow. That's early. But I think that's a, then I read that that's what Toni Morrison did. Toni Morrison. Yeah, I think I read Because that. she said that, like, if, if she phrased it better than this, <laughs> but she was like, I had to write before I heard the word mama. Because I'm like, she's turned into mama from that point on. At, through the pandemic, mom and mom, they have sort of become triggering words for me. I also have a small child. <laughs> so I, I fully understand that, Toni Morrison. Um, all right. Um, speaking of people like Toni Morrison, do you, do you guys have writing heroes? Or someone you really look up to? I do, and then every time someone asks me, it's like all the names evaporate from my brain. <laughs> um, I mean, I, go ahead. Um, I just, I love uh, Linda Hogan, the native poet, and Sandra Cisneros, of course. Um, I really like Alberto Rios. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of his now. Um, and Madeline Miller, the woman who wrote Circe. Uh, she, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember, it was my migraine, <laughs> um, if I said her name correctly. She, no, uh, her, her work blew me away. Um, I've only read one and I'm saving the other. I'm saving, uh, the first one is somewhere here. <laughs> um, yes. I told I was told that that book, book, book might break me, so I'm waiting until I feel stronger. <laughs> so there's a there's a few names. I inhaled that one. <laughs> yes, there's another. I have a story about Song of Achilles that Mandy knows. Remember when we went to go see her talk, 
and the friend. But anyway, at a book signing that I did, a friend of mine in Mandy's um, came, but she'd already bought the book. She already had my book. And so I told her that she should buy Song of Achilles. Cause like, if you're at a bookstore and like, you can buy a Song of Achilles, why wouldn't you? And then I signed it like as if I'd read it. I was like, best wishes, Annie. Love, Samantha. <laughs> Cause I love that book so much, which I wrote it. Um, and I also like, it's about like, index. I, I think that as far as like, how to describe something in a non-expected way. Um, she's wonderful at that. Um, and I always say Annie Dillard, mostly an essayist. But I recently looked at something of hers and realized how much sentence structure stuff that I've like ingrained slash stolen. She uses a lot of dash and I use a lot of dash. Um, what's the last book that you truly loved reading? I know. Wait, are we supposed to say this one? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> besides this one. Um, Piranesi by Susanna Clark, who wrote Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, right? So she came out with a, a new book over the summer called Piranesi. I love this. Oh, it's so, it is so... It is so wonderful. Mandy, you would really like it. Okay. I mean, everybody would really like it, but I, I think Mandy would like it. What about like you and Mr. Strange and Mr. Noel, right? Um, does it have to be a young adult book? Not at all. It can okay. Be this is the re most recent book I have loved. It's a romance called The Roommate by Rosie Donnan. It's uh, really hot. <laughs> I liked it. I enjoyed it. I, I keep rereading it because I'm writing a, a, an adult romance and the tension is just so good. So I keep rereading it to try to learn about how to capture it. Oh. Wow. Okay. Um, that kind of goes into my next little question. Happily ever after or tragic ending? What's your preference? ATAs, or at least the hope of them. Okay. Samantha? Well, I, I always want to write a book with a happy ending, and then it ends up like, and then he runs her over with his truck. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's, and then that, that's what, that was, that's what needs, that's what the story needs, you know? But um, there's always hope at the end. It's just a little bit like, I'm not sure if that's going to work. Yeah. Well, life doesn't always have the happy ending tied up with a little bow. So it, I think both types of, of endings are quite valid. And, and the ones that are kind of bittersweet, as most of life is. <laughs> um. So uh, last question, um, if one of our audience members has just finished your book, um, or actually both books, what's the next thing they should read? I'm going to be a little narcissistic and say my next book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's it called it's called i don't know if you can see clear it's called how moon flantis fell in love with the universe that cover is beautiful it comes out august of this year um and it's a love story and i would also recommend uh land of the cranes by aida salazar it's a middle grade novel in verse about a girl who is taken to a detention center with her mother really beautiful and moving. Samantha? I mean, I, the only thing that's coming to mind is a book that I mentioned to Mandy before we started, which is a book called Inland by Tia Obrecht, who wrote a book that I love called The Tiger's Wife. I love Inland too. The Tiger's Wife was like a game changer as far as you know, writing goes for me. 
But as far as sort of reinventing the Western narrative, she does that, and I, I love that. <clears throat> um, it's about like a woman trying to survive on her own with one narrative and then another narrative. It's about camels, and it takes place in the like 1840s in Arizona. And it's just like, what is this? Like, this is so brilliant. So, so, so. Did you say camels? Camels. Okay. Wow. Cool. Okay. I mean, it's real. It's based on real stuff. Like, apparently, the army got the idea to bring camels over of like an equestrian unit, like as a like an experiment to see if they would be good military animals. All right. And so there are like wild camels in the Southwest or, or like it, it, or the last of them just died out. Like it's something amazing like that. Wow. I know. I, knew. I certainly didn't. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're kind of getting to where we will wind up the panel. Um, Raquel, so you have a book coming out in August. Are you working on anything else um, past that? You said you're working on a, an adult romance. Can you tell us anything about that? Um, it's a rom-com with a lot of uh, romantic tropes in it. I just love tropes. So uh, she's the quirky one and he's the stern one. <laughs> so, um, and I'm also about to revise my third YA novel, um, which is a, a sci-fi um, story set in futuristic Appalachia with robots. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Um, and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the, the, um, the one that's coming out in August, can you tell us just a little bit about that book? Yeah. Uh, Moon Fuentes, the illustrated girl here, is the ugly twin, or she thinks, so she thinks, um, and her, her twin sister is a social media star, an influencer, and mm -hmm. she's forced to join her on this road trip, which is a tour with the influencers um, and her job is to be the merch girl. And while she's getting to know everyone, um, there's a boy there who accidentally hears her calling him uh, a name, uh, calling him, but it was sarcastically. She called him chupacabra poop, just sarcastically. <laughs> and, uh, and he got really mad about it and they became enemies. Who secretly have crushes on each other. Another <laughs> great trope. <laughs> <laughs> Enemies to loves, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the gist of the plot of that one. Excellent. Well, I'm excited for it. And Samantha, are are you working on anything that you can tell us about, or give us a tiny yeah. hint? Um. I'm, I'm writing a book. I mean, will it become a book? I don't know. It's under contract, but like that doesn't mean it will see the light of day. But it's um, kind of based on um, a old movie with Spencer Tracy called A Bad Day at Black Rock, where it's where he goes to a town and over the course of like 24 hours, it's like all this awful stuff kind of happens. So it's like a noir, but it's also set in like a Western town. Um, and so I, I wanted to, that, that again, I like framework. So I wanted to have it be like, someone goes somewhere for a certain reason and have to stay there for 24 hours as like everything gets awful. Um, and like, it's, it's that. Just trying to figure out something and then figures it out and then everything gets like, it's my attempt at a thriller. Ah. And um, since you also had a book that came out during the pandemic, um, Tigers Not Daughters, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. 
Um, so it's about three sisters um, and it's the sort of on the year anniversary of the death of their oldest sister, their fourth sister. And, you know, they've been grieving in different ways over the course of a year. They realize that their sister has come back to haunt their house and they're trying to figure out why. This is a quick pitch for that. It's so good. <laughs> I really, really loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that is all of my questions for our panel. Do you guys have any parting words? No, I'm gonna get up and get something, but keep talking. Cause this, okay. let me show you. Let's see if Raquel has any parting words. Just thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the questions and I enjoyed a small story about the sky. I had fun. My parting words. <laughs> I had to dig this out of the closet, but like our covers have like kind of similar vibes on them where it's like the two people and this is the my gay cactus and you have the squirrel cactus. Yeah, Isn't on either cool? side. Yeah. Isn't that funny? With like the, the kind of orb sort of yeah. background. Yeah. <laughs> Both such cool covers. Um, I think you guys lucked out with those covers. Um, Sam, did you have any parting words? No, I just, I appreciate um, you guys having me and talking about this book that I haven't talked about in a while. So, um, you know, I, I was thinking about if someone asked me what my favorite book was, it would be all the one in the world. Like, I just think it's the coolest book I know. Um, I think that Tigers Not Daughters is other people's favorite book. I like this one because I think it's pretty weird and cool. I like talking they're, about it. Yeah, they're both great. <laughs> um, I would love to thank both of you um, for coming and spending an hour with us um, here in Irving, Texas, but not in Irving, Texas, because we're all in our homes. <laughs> um, and I want to just let all of our watchers, all of our viewers know um, that A Small Story About the Sky is, um, we've been giving out free copies. Um, it's also available on Hoopla for free as an ebook um, through your Irving Public Library card. So um, please check it out. Um, and we have uh, many more programs. This is our brochure. It's very pretty. <laughs> we have many more programs. Um, throughout the rest of the month. And it, our entire program culminates with Alberto Rios himself doing a keynote, which of course was meant to be in person, but will now be virtual. So everyone around the world can watch him talk about a small story about this guy and all of his inspiration um, and his long career as a poet um, and as Arizona's first poet laureate. So um, that's on February 27th, it's a Saturday night at seven. Um, and so I hope everyone can um, tune in for that too. And uh, I really appreciate um, you guys having a little chat with me tonight. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank, thank you everyone you. for watching. See you, good night. Bye.